the things that remain. To strengthen the things that remain. This word things does not refer here to people, but rather to spiritual realities. It is likely that every dead church has at least a remnant of the living. If you remember the series of messages on the life and ministry of prophet Elijah from summer months, when Elijah got really depressed, despaired, when he became even suicidal, he was asking, pleading God to take his life, God told him, you know, Elijah, there are 7,000 other men in Israel who did not bow down before Baals. 7,000 other men. You're not alone. Don't worry. There are some others. You're never alone. There are other faithful believers in God, Jehovah. The Lord calls the true believers in Sardis to strengthen the remaining spiritual graces of the church. So, next point is, uh, let's see. Christ called Christians in Sardis to remember what they have received and heard. Let me just read verse 3 one more time. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Remember what you have received and heard. They needed to go back to the truth of God's Word, remembering the gospel of Jesus Christ and His apostles. How could they do that? By reading, studying the Word of God, by listening to the proclamation of God's truth. They needed to establish a solid doctrinal foundation to serve as a base for renewal. My dear friends, if you read, if you've ever read the stories of great spiritual awakenings and revivals in England, Scotland, Wales, Germany, Europe, South, North America, Asia, African countries, you would come to the same conclusion. The true spiritual awakening always started with a fervent prayer and return to the to the truth of God's Word. When I read just recently how some spiritual revivals happened in different communities in uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries of England, Wales, and Scotland, I was just blown away. When people came uh, to their tea rooms, our version of coffee shops, even in small towns, communities in England, they came there, neighbors and relatives, and guess what they were talking about? They were talking in their coffee coffee shops about the great things of God and how God is moving in people's hearts in that community. When I read that, I just, I've been to many coffee shops in Swan Valley and in Dauphin and what now, and you've been there many times. Can you imagine next time you come to our beautiful Tim Horton or DQ or McDonald's and everything, and you see people sitting there and they're talking about Jesus. You'll be like, wow. Am I in Nepal, or Manitoba, or am I, am I in heaven somewhere? They're talking about Jesus in a coffee shop. Not about hunting, fishing, uh, watering, uh, plowing, disking, uh, weeding. Uh, it's all good, it's all good um, foundation, funny, friendly conversation. But when revival happens, people talk about God and things of God. Christians in Sardis needed to reaffirm their belief in the truth about Jesus Christ, sin, salvation, and growth or sanctification in Christ. They needed to be reminded of that. Another sub-point, uh, Christ called Christians to keep the truth they received and heard. It's very important to keep it in your mind, in your heart, in your life, like Orthodox correct theology apart from obedient lives would not bring any revival. Why? Because according to the Bible, I think I have it on this slide or not, because according to the Bible, remembering is more than just thinking. It involves doing. If you tell your wife or your, or your husband or your child, your son and daughter, I love you. You know how I love you. You know how I love you. And it's only just a bunch of words and sentences and compliments. It's great. But eventually you need to prove and show and demonstrate your love by doing something. Just reading and hearing God's word is not enough. We must let it transform us. We have to be as committed to obedience as we're committed to the right doctrine or theology. And it's very, very important. Another sub-point is um, 
Christ called Christians in Sardis to repent. And we can hear, we can see this word in all those letters to churches. Repent. Repent. The Lord called for a decisive change of mind and attitude that would set Christians in Sardis on the right course toward recovery. They needed to repent. The believers in Sardis were to confess and turn away from their sins with remorse and sorrow. So these are the five steps of commands from Christ to his followers in Sardis. If diligently practiced, lived out, they would bring spiritual revival in the church. Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, remember what you have heard and received, keep it and repent. So now a question may raise up. Is it possible for a dead church to change? In the case of Sardis, the answer was yes, because a few people had remained faithful to Christ. So point number three of this message sounds as follows. God's comfort and encouragement to the faithful ones in verses 4 and 5. And three promises can be found in these verses from the Lord. God's comfort and encouragement, verses 4 and 5. But you have... A few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Wow. Praises be, praises be to God. Let me say something here. Jesus Christ does not ask these faithful Christians to leave the nominal majority, but to maintain their presence within that community and congregation as a witness. Because it's so easy. You know, we can hear, we probably, you've been in that boat many times in that shoes. You can say, you can blame, you can accuse your church saying, oh, the church is just dead. The leaders, those bunch of deacons, they're dead. The pastor is dead. They don't care. They do not believe the gospel. They do not practice the gospel. I am out of here. I'm going to another church. And this religious tourism has become so common and popular. Like people switch from one church to another and just and they just continue, just so much fun you can see different churches and you got religious tourism no no matter how badly God's people fall the Lord always preserves a remnant to carry out his will and to bring forth fruit in Isaiah in the Old Testament 10 21 we read a remnant will return the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God there's always hope that God can use his faithful remnant to bring the revival. In Romans 11.5, God through Apostle Paul says, Romans 11.5, There has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. The faithful remnant can also serve as the seed for revival. There must be somebody or someone faithful for God to start acting. Verse 5, one more time. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels, his angels. True believers were and are and will always be the overcomers whose righteous acts and living marked them as true Christians. And Jesus addressed his faithful remnant here at the close of his message to that troubled church. He mentioned his first promise to them two times. They would walk in white garments, in white garments. Just for a second, can you imagine, portray this picture, my dear ones, if next Sunday everybody uh, who comes to the church for the Sunday service will be dressed in white. Shall we do that next Sunday? Everybody's wearing white. White pants, white shorts, 
white shirts, uh, white skirts, white dresses, it'll be quite a picture. The white robes represent the cleansing from sin received by faith in Christ. And this very image of walking in white is a promise of eternal unblemished righteousness. Eternal unblemished righteousness, which believers receive from Jesus Christ. So, according to the Bible, white robes are reserved for Christ. Matthew 17, 2, remember the scene of transfiguration on the top of the mountain when Jesus' garments became so bright, so white. So, white robes are reserved for Christ. Holy angels, Revelation 13, 8, Revelation 17, 8, and the glorified church would be dressed in white garments. Revelation 19, 8, Revelation 19, 14. In the ancient times, white robes were often worn at festivals and special celebrations. What is Christ's second promise to the faithful ones? The first one is uh, they would walk in white garments. The second promise is that he would never erase their names from the book of life. It's kind of a very interesting book of life. If you make your own search or research from Genesis to Revelation, all those verses about the book of life, very, very interesting. It, it, was, it is a symbol of eternal security, the book of life. Our future blessings are certain as if God had written our names in a great registry of the citizens of heaven. And this divine record book has the names of all those whom God has chosen to save and who possess eternal life. And many references, Revelation 13, 8, 17, 8, 20, 12, 21, 27. For the sake of time, I would encourage you to read those verses at home. Under no circumstances will God erase those names from the book of life, as city officials often did of undesirable people on their roles. You can lose your citizenship, you can lose some other rights, but if you're truly a child of God, God would keep you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit would keep you in their hand. And the third promise from the Lord Jesus is to confess the names of his faithful ones before the Father and before his angels, as we have read in verse 5. And in Matthew 10, 32, Matthew 10, 32 says, Everyone who confesses me before man, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Remember this verse always. Maybe the time is coming when we will be required to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe we'll be just asked, okay, tell me now. I want to know, are you believing in Jesus Christ or not? And that will be, it would require lots of humility and strength to say, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will one day stand beside believers whom God the Father has graciously clothed in white, and he will proclaim, this one is mine. And this one is mine, and his name is, and her name is, he or she is a child of the king. They belong to me. They're mine, my possession, my precious possession. I paid for them with the blood of Jesus Christ, with the blood of my son. Before the closing application to this message, let me remind you those five commands or steps of spiritual restoration or recovery for a dead church and three promises from Christ to his disciples. So those five commands to the dead church are wake up, strengthen the things that remain, remember what you have received and heard, keep the truth of God, and repent of your sins. Three promises to the faithful ones are the following. They will walk in the white garments before God. Their names will not be erased from the book of life. And Jesus Christ will confess their names of his faithful ones before God the Father and before his angels. For conclusion, uh, let me just go there. Number one, the indifferent believers need to wake up before it is too late to save their church or churches from God's discipline. Looks can be deceiving. 
More than ever, we need to avoid misdiagnosis. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Remember what prophet Samuel said when God sent him to anoint the next king for Israel. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. 2. Um, the faithful few can take comfort in the knowledge that their salvation is eternally secure. 3. Until Jesus Christ returns, it is not too late for other dead churches to find the road map to spiritual revival. The encouragement is that no church is beyond hope as long as there is a faithful remnant in it, willing to strengthen the things that remain. A couple of quotes. Uh, one from George Whitfield and another one from Albert Merler. Uh, George Whitfield, a uh, famous pastor and evangelist, he said a long time ago, the Christian world is in a deep sleep. Nothing but a loud shout can awaken them out of it. And it was said quite a while ago by George Whitfield. Albert Merler, Jr., the president of Southern Baptist Seminary, said uh, a few years ago, we're not a generation marked by passion. Passion can be lost in programs and progress reports and institutions and calendars. In doing what is good, we may fail to do what is best. That's the president of the theological seminary said. And I, as I read it, I was thinking, well, how can you run the seminary without planning, pre-planning, and all of that? But that's what he said. Before the closing prayer, to encourage us all, giving us lots of hope, let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 20, 29, and 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Wow. If you read these verses, if you're truly the child of God, praises, praises, praises be to God Almighty. If you're not the child of God yet, you are in an incredible danger. You are in a sad, gloomy danger of losing your life, of spending eternity in the lake of fire. Do not play with, you, with this life. It is so short-lived. I'm only 50, but when I look back, how fast have they gone by those 50 years? Like 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Just a couple of nights ago, I was kind of recollecting my dream, the oldest girl, the oldest daughter of ours, as she started walking, over, some, somehow in the middle of my, my dream. And now she's 23, married with two kids. The time goes by so quickly, and the eternity is coming. And there are two ways to spend eternity, with God or without God. With God and His faithful ones, or without God, with Satan, his minions, and the lost, unrepentant ones. So make a wise choice, and may God bless and keep you in his grace if you're already God's children. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we're hoping that we are not a dead church here. If we are, show it to us. If we're not... It is not our service. It is your grace, your power, your strength. But Lord, show to us what can be corrected by your grace and mercy through the 
ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're just praying for, for our congregation to stay strong in these latter days before the rapture of the church, before your second coming. Lord, bless us to be faithful and joyful followers of you. Lord, uh, keep doing your work in our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit. Reveal what needs to be corrected and encourage us where we need to go and continue. Lord, uh, just be with us with your flock here. And as, as you said yourself, do not be afraid, the little flock, for you, you have given us the kingdom. And Lord, remind us that we have a bright future, much brighter future than the next day or the next week or the next year in this world. Lord, please accept our thanksgiving and gratitude for what you have done, for what you're doing in your church and in this world. That's what we asked and prayed for in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of thy God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people inside us who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and will not erase his name from the book of life, and will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God bless the reading of this word. If you do not mind, Peter and Lawrence, I'm really scared of this microphone. I just right? Okay, I'll just a little bit down this way. Then I can see you better. Thank you so much, and praises be to God. What a message to the church in Sardis we're having uh, this morning to our prayerful consideration and study. Before we go into this text, I need God's support. I need a prayer. Let's bow for a prayer. Yes, Father God, thank you so much for sending your Son, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to this world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for becoming that ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for being the Good Shepherd, the door of salvation. Thank you for being the light of the world, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being our everything and all in our lives. Lord, we are going to study this uh, very serious message to the church in Sardis. And uh, the same message to many churches nowadays, maybe including our church. Help us to understand it and apply it well. If we need to correct something, please show it to us how and where before it becomes too late. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, I think maybe two or three years ago, there was a survey kind of a research done in Canada um, at the national level. I think it was done by both secular reporters, journalists, and by the Christian reporters. And they came almost to the same conclusion that within 10, 15 years, one third of church buildings in Canada will be, would be permanently closed. So when I read that article, that research for the first time, my heart was really troubled. I was almost like depressed by the statistics uh, they gave in that article, in that search. One third of church buildings in Canada would be closed within 10, 15 years. And it was, and that research had been done uh, in pre-COVID-19 times. You know what happened uh, in uh, the recent 20 months of this uh, pandemic, things like that. But anyways, one why am I saying that? Because it's uh, fitting uh, to the topic, to the subject of the text we're studying this morning. In the introduction part, I just would like to start with this question. Have you ever been to a dead church personally? 
uh, you can raise your hand and you can share your comments, your uh, reminiscences, your impressions. Have you ever been to a dead church? Anybody? Dead church. Have you attended a dead church? Have you gone to a dead church? Probably you're afraid of raising your hand. That's okay. I can repeat this question next Sunday. Have you ever seen an empty or closed church buildings in Manitoba? You can raise your hands. Have you seen closed buildings, church buildings in Manitoba? How about the province of the living skies? Have you seen closed church buildings in Saskatchewan? You can raise your hands. How about Ontario? How about other provinces? And unfortunately, it's becoming a scene, especially, I would dare say, in the prairie provinces. If you just drive on dusty gravel roads deep in Bear Country, you can see often those uh, closed uh, church buildings. In fact, quite a few church buildings became museums, monuments provincial or if not national historic sites. They used to be long time ago vibrant congregations of God's people where people came to worship God. Nowadays many of those churches have become museums, monuments, historical sites. How can a church die? If a church is a family of God's children, how can a church die? Well, let me use some sarcasm here. And sarcasm is a speech device, and I hope I'll be forgiven. I want, actually, I know how to leave the building through other doors, not just through this one. A pastor of the dead church usually graduates from a theological cemetery. Because many Bible colleges or seminaries, they can, hear, they, they can have or bear the title Bible college or Christian college or Christian seminary, but they lost the foundation of Christian faith. They may have lost by now the Bible as the foundation of Christian uh, doctrine and Christian life. So a pastor of the dead church usually graduates from a theological cemetery. Not seminary, but cemetery. The church choir or the church worship band can often sing Amazing Grave, How Sweet the Ground, instead of saving Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. When the rapture of the church comes, those people will be the first church taken up because the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16b, the dead in Christ will rise first. And another phrase, it's paraphrased, and I'm asking for your forgiveness beforehand. Remember what Jesus said, he taught in one of his parables. Many are, what? Called, but few are chosen. So in the dead church, it, can, it may sound something like this. Many are called, and a few are frozen. Can be said about the dead church. How I wish that a dead church would be as obvious as that. However, most churches, even dead ones, look alive on the outside. What appears alive from human perspective may be totally dead in the eyes of the Lord God. And in our text this morning, we're going to see how the great physician, the best healer, conducts an autopsy. The great physician is the resurrection and life. John chapter 11, verse 25. And his name is Jesus Christ. He turned an autopsy into the offer of life to this congregation in Sardis. But let me ask you this question. Maybe not all of you are familiar, maybe kids and even adults. What is an autopsy? Can anybody give us an answer? What is an autopsy? What is it? Someday it will be done to our bodies. Are you aware of that? An autopsy. Okay, if you go to Mr. Google, uh, he is our friend, not necessarily a Christian one. Autopsy is a detailed dissection of a diseased person done to determine why he or she died. Basically, it's uh, when the personnel tries or try to find out why he or she died. What caused the physical death? That's autopsy. It's done. It has to be done to find out why a person died. 
Like the rest of seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the church in Sardis was an existent church in the days of Apostle John. Yet, such churches have existed throughout history and continue to exist at present time. The pattern, unfortunately, has been in place across cultures and across centuries. As usual, before going into some details, let me give you some of the historical context of these verses. Ancient city of Sardis, the capital city of Lydia, I think we can see it on the slide on the map where it was uh, located. Um, that's just uh, how the former city of Sardis looks like in modern Turkey, just some ruins. But on the map, you can see that's where the Sardis was located, a little bit far from the Mediterranean coast and in inland, but still it was that postal uh, express or Canada Post route or Asia Minor route. That's how they delivered post, just covering all those cities. The capital city of Lydia was an important city. It lay about 90 kilometers east of Ephesus, or northeast of Ephesus, and at the junction of five main roads, and it was a center of trade. We cannot see uh, those roads, and I was thinking, where else can we find five gravel roads in our part of Manitoba? If you know where Herman Lepke and other, and other of our church members live, especially Herman and Linda, on the way to their place and somewhere in Bernie area, right in Mountain, I forgot. There's kind of an interest in five gravel roads, if you, be, if you know what I'm talking about. Many gravel roads, and you can choose which way to go. So that was the location of Sardis, a very good location for trade, for commerce. The city was located on the top of the hill. It was 450 meters above the valley. And Sardis was famous for its manufacture of woolen garments. And they do not just make wool, they dyed wool. They used paint. And that's why uh, we can see a verse kind of referring to that in uh, this chapter, in, uh, in verse, I guess, it's in verse 4. The main religion in Sardis was the worship of Artemis, one of the nature cults that built on the idea of death and rebirth, death and rebirth. The church in Sardis at that time was in a desperate and pretty sad spiritual condition. And in verses 1 through 6, Jesus offers his divine solution to the desperate spiritual needs of that congregation in that city. So point number one, which I would like to make in this message is the correspondent of this message to Christian in, uh, in, uh, in Sardis. Verse one, how Jesus Christ introduces himself in verse one. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. The description of the divine author in each of the seven letters to churches are taken from the vision in Revelation chapter 1. I hope you still remember that vision, verses 12 through 17 in chapter 1. Here in verse 1, the Lord Jesus is represented in his church or to his church through the Holy Spirit, those seven spirits. Christ depicts himself as the one who works in his church through God's Spirit, through Holy Spirit and godly ministers. God knows everything. I remember, I hope you remember the message from last Sunday when Bryce preached here. God knows everything. God sees everything. He's able to see everything as it is. You cannot hide anything from the almighty and all-knowing God. This church in Sardis receives no compliment from the Lord. Nothing, none, only criticism. The only other church similarly faulted or criticized is the church in Laodicea. And Lord willing, we're going to see that uh, in the next uh, month of October. This church is almost dead. There were some, very few true believers in Christ, very few. But the church overall is dead. In modern terms, the Sardis church was filled with nominal 
cultural Christians. There's a term nowadays, nominal cultural Christians, and it's used both in Christian and non-Christian circles. This introduction in verse 1 reminded Christians in Sardis of what they lacked. Devoid of the Holy Spirit, the congregation in Sardis was dead and populated for the most part by unredeemed people. Recently I read another stats from Southern Baptist Convention in the United States. It's the largest Protestant or evangelical denomination in the world. In the past they boasted like they had millions and millions of Southern Baptists in the United States and some other parts of the world. In recent decade or two, they noticed, they came to the conclusion that maybe half, if not over half, of their church regular attendants and uh, members, they were not redeemed people. They were not true believers in Jesus Christ. They had to admit that. Because the way the Southern Baptist Convention has been going in recent years, it was just declining. Uh, Numbers-wise, uh, mission-wise, ministries-wise, it just declined, declined, declined for some reason. So, the correspondent of this message to Christians in Sardis is Jesus Christ himself. Point number two, how does God deal with this situation? And what God can do nowadays uh, regarding dead churches? Verses two and three, where we can find five commands or steps from Christ to the dead church. Verses two and three. It's so easy to see those commands. Wake up! and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Such a recipe, a prescription from the greatest physician of all times. Jesus Christ gives the urgent command in a series of five verbs. And verbs are parts of speech that denote action. Wake up, strengthen, remember, keep, and repent. That's how they sound in my NSB translation of the Bible. Wake up, strengthen, remember, keep, and repent. So in the first one, I just would like to draw your attention is uh, Christ called Christians in Sardis to wake up, to wake up. Whenever we hear this uh, phrase, this command in our physical life, we understand what it means. Somebody is sleeping, somebody is taking a nap, and either a spouse or dad or mom or your, or your child, your son and daughter is just approaching you saying, wake up dad, it's time to go. And you're like, ah. I only just started my nap. Wake up, it's time to go. Christ laid out for Christians in Sardis the road map to spiritual restoration by giving them those five commands of five steps to follow. As if shaking someone, sleeping into unconsciousness, the Lord Jesus took his church in Sardis into his arms and shouted, Stay with me! Stay with me! Don't leave, don't fall into a sleep. They needed to wake up. They could not just go with the flow. They had to reverse the course. There was no time for indifference. B, Christ called Christians not just to wake up, but to strengthen.